We are now six months into our study through the book of 1 Peter. We have a few weeks left in this series, but boy, what a series it's been. The series is entitled Strangers. It's based on 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, where Peter writes, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. The New International Version uses the term foreigners and exiles, but a number of translations use the word strangers and aliens. Strangers. There it is. Peter's writing to this group of early Christians, and though they are facing an incredible hard time of persecution, hardship, trial, Peter keeps encouraging him. He said, man, I want you to stand out because you're strangers here. It's a great message for them. It's a great message for us. As we look at back and just think about the encouraging message that Peter's provided through this letter, if we look back in chapter 1, Peter's encouraged me. He said, man, you're going through trials, but grow in your faith. As you face these difficult days, be holy. God says, be holy because I am holy. As we go through these difficult days, Peter would remind them, focus on Jesus. As we looked at in chapter 2, it's another way of saying, when you let your light shine, in this darkest moment, in these dark days, let your light shine brightest for Jesus Christ. Then he goes to this point, and he talks about submission, particularly about submitting to authorities, those that are breaking out the persecution against early Christians. And Peter says, submit to them. At the same time, not long after that, he says, man, you can live the good life right now. These can be good days. We get to chapter 4, verse 16. If you'll remember that section, is some of the strongest language that Peter used to acknowledge this time of suffering and hardship, but also how they were to respond during this time. Peter said, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. And then we looked last week as we turned the page to chapter 5. It was a message to shepherds, to the elders of the church, to the leaders. And he's encouraging them, be, be good shepherds of the flock of God. Great message for the leaders and a great message for us. Now we turn our attention today to chapter 5, verse 5, and really as we look through the rest of the chapter the rest of the book. Uh, what we're going to find is we're going to find these series of one-sentence sermons. We're going to break this up. We'll actually take three weeks to cover this last section. We begin today specifically with verses 5 through 7. So let's look at that. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. Now, like I said, these are really, as, as we start in verse 5, these are just one-sentence sermons. Every sentence stands on itself. Every sentence really could be a sermon all by itself. But there are a couple of characteristics that each of these sentence sermons have in common. Number one, it's fundamental. This is Peter. I think this is interesting. As he gets to the end of the letter, we keep thinking, now how would you close out this letter? What is it, these final words that he would have to share with these early Christians? What would he say? And I find it interesting, Peter goes back to the basics. He goes back to fundamentals. But what we see Peter do is not unique. It's not really that unique to go back and to focus on fundamentals. Let me give you just a couple of examples from, from our world today. Well, 
<laughs> maybe not quite our world today. I learned how to type on an old manual typewriter. A little newer version than this, but not much. Do you remember when you were learning how to type, what would it be that the teacher would emphasize? Put your fingers on the home key. That was fundamental. That is a fundamental uh, importance in learning how to type and learning how to type in a quick manner and effectively. Use those home keys. Same thing holds true for those of you that know how to play the piano. That you start talking about it, even as advanced as you may get in your musical knowledge, you still have to go back. You have to know the keys. You have to be able to play the scales. For those of us that aren't interested in music, but we are interested in sports, I remember this a classic quote from legendary coach Vince Lombardi. It would start every season by holding up a football, and he would just tell his team, gentlemen, this is a football. And he would go from there to talk about fundamentals like running and blocking and tackling. But he began with the very basic fundamentals. And of course, while I'm talking about football, I'll get one in for my football coach. University of Alabama coach Nick Saban. When he talks about practice, he approaches practice with this fundamental attitude. He said, we don't want to practice until we get it right. We want to practice until we don't get it wrong. Huge difference. We don't want to just practice until we get it right. We want to practice until we don't get it wrong. What he's talking about is establishing an environment, a spirit of excellence. These are fundamental core elements, whether we're talking about typing, piano, or football, or Christianity. Peter is going to take us back to some fundamentals. He's going to take us back and he's going to emphasize in these one-sentence sermons fundamental attitudes. I think it's going to be interesting as we go through and as we read these that this is not really a list. There are a number of lists in the New Testament of things that we need to do or don't do. This list is different than that. This list is about an attitude. This is not about what we do. This is about who we are called to be. When we start talking about, for instance, today, this is a preview of our lesson. We're going to talk about the, the topics of submission, humility, and trust. That's not really something we do. It's who we are. This is an attitude that is to be, this is a fundamental attitude of Christianity. So I want us to approach the text this morning with that idea in mind. So let's get started, shall we? Chapter 5, we're just really looking at the first part of this fifth verse. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. Notice this phrase, in the same way. Other translations will use the word likewise. Uh, and this is what this is saying is, this isn't really Peter changing topics. He's changing the group to whom he's addressing but he's not really changing topics. In verses 1 through 4, he's talked about the importance of being good shepherds. And now as he turns to verse 5, he's going to talk about the importance of being good sheep. So I think that's going to be interesting for us to follow that. And what we're going to notice here is he's going to talk about the importance of really a fundamental aspect of church. The importance of being good shepherds, good leaders, and the importance of being good sheep the importance of being good followers. Now, this idea of submission, it is not new. If we go back to chapter 2, it's as I mentioned earlier, uh, Peter went through an entire section where he talked about submission. He talked about living in submission in society to those governing authorities. Again, remember who that was at that particular time. And what Peter's telling them is live in submission to the governing authorities. He'll go on and he'll talk to particularly slaves and their relationship to masters. We made application for that for us as employees in our relationship to our employers. But we need to live in submission. When we're on the job and we're in the workplace, that we need to do a good job. 
We want to let our light shine for Christ, especially on the job. And then in chapter 3 he began, he was talking to wives about living in submission to their husbands. Even when their husbands were not believers, not Christians. He's talking about the fact that you could live your life in such a way as to lead your spouse to Christ. And so this idea of living in submission, it's not new. But he brings it back up again in chapter 5. He brings it back up again in chapter 5 in this specific context of being good shepherds and being good sheep. There is a thought here. The New American Standard uh, usually uh, would go along with the, the large group of translations. This is one of the unique times that the New American Standard really stands out by itself. The translation in 1 Peter chapter 5 in the New American Standard, says, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. What's Peter's message here? If, just for a moment, let's if, if this translation is correct, and Peter was specifically addressing younger men, if that was the case, it wouldn't be the first time in history and wouldn't be the last time that it would be necessary to tell younger men to... Obey your elders. We see it in society. We also see it in the church. It's a matter of respect. It's a matter of honor. And it's a matter of submission. One of the things about young men growing to be strong leaders in the future is a recognition and a respect for leadership today. So that is going to be critically important. So again, if the New American Standard is right in that, boy, there is a great application here because he was talking about being good shepherds, and now he's telling these young men, be good sheep, be good followers, submit to your elders, and and this is in a church leadership context. Submit to your elders, submit to those spiritual leaders among you. Now, this word submission, it's a military term, and it talks about literally to line up under. And so when we think about this and think about in submission is we're letting our leaders lead in the church. That's why it's so important when we talk about having elders and deacons, those leaders in the church. That's why this is so important because in order for us to move forward, we have to have someone to follow. And we want these spiritual leaders to be the ones that are leading the way. That as they study Scripture and as they are men of prayer, that we have respected them, we have recognized them as spiritual leaders among us. They are indeed shepherds of the flock. And in the same way that the shepherd would lead that flock of sheep, we look to our spiritual leaders to be leaders in the church. All right, this is a difficult uh, topic because... Peter has addressed the importance of being good leaders. Well, what if the leaders aren't always good leaders? Then he's talked about being good followers. Well, what if we aren't always good followers? You know, the New American Standard said young men, but every other translation just says younger. And so there is a message for us, and we believe that there's a message for us. How do we strike balance in that? Let me just share with you this statement. Let's read through this together, and I think it will help us see the importance of good leaders and good followers, good shepherds and good sheep. All right, let's read this. There is nothing more distressing than a congregation who does not respect their leaders or submit to their Bible-given authority. In the same breath, I would add, there is nothing more discouraging to a congregation than irresponsible spiritual leadership. But where we have godly and mature spiritual leadership, we give honor, respect, and submission. We line up under their leadership. It speaks of their spiritual maturity and ours. So you see the beauty of that is when we have these leaders in place that are godly leaders, men of God, Men of the word, men of prayer, humble men. That's a point that's coming up. 
humble men, and, and we follow them. We're being good sheep because we too are studying and we are growing. Man, what a great combination, what great chemistry in the church to be effective as God's people, especially during this time of hardship, during this time of suffering, and during this time of trial. Let's keep moving. We're going to go ahead and, and move down in verse 5 and pick up where we left off. Peter says, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. All right, now, if there was any question about this first section of submission, whether this was to just to younger people or to young men, there is no question now. <laughs> because now Peter just simply says, all of you. And there's not any disagreement in, in the translations here. So he talks about all of you, and he's saying, I want you to be people of humility. Now, I like this. It's, this attitude of submission is a twin to an attitude of humility. In other words, these build on each other. They, they aren't separate. They, they really do fit together. If the attitude of submission attacks self-promoting pride, then the attitude of humility attacks self-love. I, I love this, but what but this self-promoting pride would say is that I don't need to follow anybody. I'll take care of all of this myself. But no, we recognize the importance of spiritual leaders, of their knowledge, of their wisdom, of their walk with God. But when we start talking about humility, we're talking about the fact that, that we look at others. We see the importance of others. We don't look down on other people. And so there's going to be a great way that these ideas work together and build on each other. Peter says, all of you. He says, clothe yourselves. Now, this word clothe yourselves, this term, has a great, has a rich history. It really is talking about uh, taking an apron and tying it in a knot or in a bow. But it's really not just an apron, particularly it's a work apron, of putting on a work apron and tying it in a bow or a knot. But it even goes a level farther. That This is really talking about the apron that a slave or a servant would wear, of putting on that apron and tying it in a bow or a knot. So what we're talking about is putting on the apron of a servant. Clothe yourselves with humility. Is humility. The, the, the Strong's Concordance definition of this is lowliness of mind. In other words, we, we just don't, we don't overthink about ourselves. We don't think too much of ourselves. We don't think we're better than other people. We don't look down on other people. Now here's the thing that we need to understand. This idea of humility. I don't know that it has ever been fully accepted by the world. It's not seen as this great virtue by the world. Uh, if you look and what they would see somebody as humble as they would see them as a doormat, somebody just to be trampled over. That's not what humility means. The thing that put humility on the map, if you will, was Jesus. Was Jesus who came in, and I think back to that story in John chapter 13, where Jesus wanted to show them the full extent of his love. And he got up from that evening meal and he took a towel. He would, if you will, he took the servant's apron and he wrapped it around him. And he took the bowl, a basin of water, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. He took on the lowest possible task in the room that night. That's humility. And that is the example. Jesus would tell his disciples that. Just verses later, he said, I have set you an example that you should do as I've done to you, that you should be servants to one another. So Jesus was setting that example. Uh, Paul, as he is writing about Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, he looks at this humility from a divine perspective, if you will. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus 
who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Look back very quickly, if you will, in verse 7. Taking on the very nature of a servant. In other words, Jesus took that servant apron and he wrapped it around him and he tied it in a knot. Jesus showed himself to be a servant by coming to earth and living among us, particularly in the way he did and what he came to do. Jesus came to earth and he lived as a servant. We see that in very practical ways as when he went and washed the disciples' feet. As we return to 1 Peter chapter 5, one of the things that Peter will talk about is that God opposes the proud but gives grace or favor to the humble. Uh, That's actually a phrase that we find that in 1 Peter chapter 5. We find it in James chapter 4. It has its origin back in the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 34, where the wise man would say, He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. And so Peter has this verse in mind as he's penning this final thoughts of this letter, just in the same way that James would in James chapter 4. Humility. We've talked about the clothing yourselves and talked about wrapping that that apron around us, the lowliness of mind. One of the the things that is mentioned in this letter is this phrase, this verse of the mighty hand of God. That too is a phrase, a term with a great history. Uh, If you look in the outline that I've provided for you, One of the things that you'll see is that this has a rich Old Testament history of where um, in the Old Testament, the mighty hand of God is used at times to refer to God sheltering us, but particularly it is used of talking about God delivering us, God delivering the nation of Israel from their captivity in Egypt. It is a term that is used in that context over and over and over and over just hands down more in that deliverance category than any of the others. But there's also an idea that comes up in the Old Testament of where God's mighty hand will be used to test us. So we think about this in context of the letter in 1 Peter chapter 5. Particularly this idea, God will deliver us. We need to remember that. And these early Christians needed to remember that in their time of hardship, their time of suffering, their time of trial, that God would deliver them. And He's going to shelter them. He's going to take care of them. Even if this is a time of testing right now, but ultimately, the mighty hand of God would deliver them. What a great message of encouragement as Peter is wrapping up this letter. Let's get to chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Peter's message to the Christians there is trust God. Trust God. Author Warren Wearsby says, One of the evidences of our pride is our impatience with God. And one of the reasons for our suffering is that we might learn patience. In other words, these early Christians were having to wait on God. They were experiencing just such hardship in trial, in difficult days. But they're learning patience to patiently wait for God and and to to put their trust in Him. Uh, Let's look at this word cast because this has a, again, and there's so many words and phrases in this text with a rich meaning. When we think about cast, we need to think about throwing something onto something. Uh, Perhaps the best example of that would be to take a blanket and to throw it over a horse. So it's taking something and throwing it onto something. So what does that mean for us? Well, what is it that is weighing heavy on our hearts and our minds? What is this thing? And and Peter uses the word anxiety. 
Cast your anxiety. What's causing your discontent, your discouragement, your despair? What questions do you have? The pain or the suffering? These things that are causing stress and anxiety. Take those and give it to God. Because He cares for you. Take these things and give it to God. And what a beautiful picture for us. Just a couple of verses. And we have seen the importance. These are fundamental attitudes. Fundamental attitudes. Very core of Christianity. Peter's using this as he's wrapping up this letter. Have an attitude of submission. To have an attitude of humility. And to have an attitude of trust. What an important message for us as we begin to close out this letter of 1 Peter chapter 5. There is a great story that is told by author Kathleen Norris. And she used to, to play a game with children in her elementary school class. And what she would talk about, she really was a bargaining game with them. And here's what she would say. She would say, first, I want you to make noise. Well, that's pretty easy for children to do, right? Uh, man, children making noise is like a, a crowd at a football game, or it's like the amount of sound that's going to come out of these speakers. Man, children know how to make noise, right? But this was the second part of that. She said, I want you to make noise, but then I want you to make silence. And she said even she was surprised at how well the children responded to that challenge. Make noise, man, I got it. But make silence. Make silence. Listen. And then she asked them to write down their thoughts, particularly about the silence. These are some great thoughts. These are coming from elementary school children. Uh, this was her thought that she said, man, their images often had a depth and a maturity that was unlike anything they wrote, that it was just that rich. So here's some things they said. One child said, silence is a tree spreading its branches to the sun. Silence is spiders spinning their webs. It's like a silkworm making its silk. Lord, help me to know when to be silent. Then one more thought. Silence reminds me to take my soul with me wherever I go. We live in a world that is filled with noise. We live in a world where we face hardship, where we face difficult days. How will we respond to that? Will we respond to that in the world's way? Or will we respond to that based on these fundamental attitudes that have been shared with us in 1 Peter chapter 5 today? It's important that we recognize that there are leaders among us, spiritual leaders among us, and we can learn from them. We need to learn from them. And there are times that I'm fully convinced that, man, we need to let our shepherd shepherd us. We need to let them lead us, but they may need to, to care for us. They may they need to help nurse some wounds. They may need to pick us up. Remember those critical lessons from last week. And so we submit ourselves to spiritual leaders. But we also, we want to live lives of humility. And what that means is we recognize that, that we don't look down on other people, that we want to live in a lowliness of mind, and that we're recognizing that God is great. God opposes the proud, but He gives favor to the humble. And so we listen to God's message so we might follow Him. And even in these times of anxiety, these times of trouble and of hardship, we cast our cares, our anxiety, to the Lord because He cares for us. Friends, that is where we find this peace. That is where we will find this silence. And that is where in the midst of everything that is going on around us that we can find a peace of heart and of soul of knowing that we are putting ourselves in the hand of God who cares for us and who will lead us and continue to take care of us.